I'm going to briefly introduce, um, do you go by Nathan or Nathaniel? I'm sorry. Um, Nathan, usually. Nathan. Okay. Um, and, but before, before I do that, I just want to remind people that there will not be a seminar next week because it's the Friday before our mid-semester break. Um, and nobody ever comes to those seminars. <laughs> um, so we finally decided not to have them on the Friday before break. Um, so this will be the last one before break. And then um, uh, the first one after break will be Cameron Prophet, who will be talking about um, his work in the Grand Canyon. Okay, but today we have Nathan Grove, who is our youngest speaker, I think maybe ever, <laughs> which is great, fantastic. Um, and he's a 2019 graduate of Alfred Allman Central School. Um, he is a junior at Amherst College, double majoring in geology and English, which is such a great combination. Um, although don't let anybody, don't, don't tell anybody I said that because my sister majored in English and I majored in geology and we always argued which was more um, important. So um, uh, anyway, he, uh, when he was here, he played actually in the university orchestra um, and has always has claimed to always have an interest in dinosaurs and, and science. Um, and he is the son of Amy Jacobson and Alan Grove of Alfred, sister or brother of Abby Grove. <laughs> and I see some other Groves um, that have joined us through Zoom. So I'm assuming he's related to them too. Um, in any case, he spent his summer in Alaska um, working on studying a glacier. So I'm gonna turn it over to him and he can tell us about his um, adventures and about this really neat glacier. Yeah, thank you very much, Michelle. I've uh, never been introduced before giving a talk, so that was pretty cool. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen really quick if I can. All right, so. Hi everyone. Um, over the summer, I was working as a tour guide on the Montanuska Glacier in Alaska. So I was leading guided hikes out onto the glacier for various groups of uh, people, mostly tourists, um, which basically means that I know a little bit about a whole lot of things as opposed to a whole lot about one thing. So this talk might be a little bit of a summary and a little bit of a jumbled mess, but um, I'm gonna do my best. To start off, I wanna give you all a little bit of an overview of what my life consisted of on the glacier. I was one of 16 guides working over the summer. All of the rest of them are pictured right here. Um, pretty much all of us were geology or environmental science students from various universities and colleges across the United States. We had some like, chemistry people and pre-med people, but for the most part, just geology and earth science nerds. Um, we did have access to a kitchen, a shower, and a laundry machine back at our main building, but we were basically camping out in the Alaskan wilderness all summer. Um, this right here is my tent, uh, about a 20 minute walk away from the base of the glacier. Um, we worked in staggered shifts throughout the day, scheduled so that there would be at least two guides ready on each hour to take out a tour, um, which were between two and three hours long, about four miles of hiking in total, um, with groups of anywhere between five and 25 people, depending on how busy we were. And on any given day, um, each guide would do between two and three tours. Um, before going out on the glacier, everyone was outfitted with helmets like the one on the right, right here, and micro spikes, which are pictured on the left. Um, they're basically just like these rubber sock things that have uh, metal spikes on the bottoms that are, you put over your shoes, like mini crampons that help you to walk on the ice. So everyone guides tourists, everyone um, puts these on. And we got people from all different places, backgrounds, education levels, physical ability levels. Um, although most people were coming from the United States because of COVID restrictions. But you know, one girl showed up on crutches. Um, one day, another guide and I took out a group of 50 missionary high school students from Utah. Sometimes people wanted to learn about the glacier. Sometimes they did not want to learn about the glacier um, and only wanted to take pictures. But I always try to teach them about the glacier regardless. And since you all are stuck with me right now, I'm going to try to 
uh, teach all of you. And I'm also not trying to get any of you to tip me. So I'm just going to keep talking. This is going to be a little bit of a basic overview of glaciers. Um, so for those of you who are very unfamiliar, glaciers are rivers of ice that are constantly flowing downhill. So they form from snowfall far up somewhere, typically on a mountain, um, which then as the snow accumulates and accumulates and accumulates, packs itself down under its own weight into glacier ice, which as it builds up, then succumbs to its own weight and gravity and begins to slide downhill. So they really do work basically exactly like rivers. Um, you can see that the main glacier is right here on this diagram. These small white things off in the mountains over here are also glaciers. We call those tributary glaciers. So really it just, uh, it works exactly like um, a river, instead of having a watershed, it has an ice shed and all of these little valleys and things in the mountains are catching ice and snow and then distributing it into the main glacier, which then keeps flowing downhill. So it's just a river moving a little bit more slowly. It's always flowing downhill. That's a really important point. Even when glaciers are receding and they are moving backwards, they are always flowing downhill. And I'll get a little bit more into that later. Our hikes we're mostly centered around the face of the glacier. Um, this is the picture that I just showed. Um, this is the area of the glacier where it is calving, which means that chunks of it are falling off into the water. Um, these are the dramatic videos that you have no doubt seen online of massive chunks of ice falling off glaciers. Typically, those are falling off into the ocean. The Montanusa Glacier is not in contact with the ocean, which is actually very important for um, its glacial physics and anatomy and stuff. And I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, it is calving into this lake right here, which is um, a special type of lake called a tarn. A tarn is a lake that a glacier is calving into that is still a part of the glacier. So beneath this water right here in front of the glacier is actually more glacier ice at this point in the glacier, it's about 900 feet thick, which is pretty thin for this glacier. It's kind of petering out as it gets to its end. Um, but the tarn is only about 400 feet deep, which leaves 500 feet of, of ice still underneath it. So it's calving into this body of water that is actually still located on the glacier. And then that water starts flowing down kind of towards the bottom right of your screen right here into the Montanuska River. So our hikes went out on the left over here onto this ice and then kind of got towards the face right over there. This ice at the far end of the glacier is the oldest ice on the glacier. Um, this is about 600 years old. That does not mean that the glacier is only 600 years old. It basically works like a big kind of conveyor belt of ice where ice is constantly forming up at the top and then flowing down and melting and calving off of the front. So the glacier is actually about 2 million years old. This ice right here is only 600 years old, which represents a small fragment of the glacier's actual history, um, but is the oldest ice on the glacier. So we always you know, tell the tourists that. Um, most of the glacier, as you can kind of see from this left-hand segment right here, is actually covered in rocks. Um, these are some more pictures of rocks on top of the glacier. This is my friend Lily on the left, who is also a guide. Most tourists who show up don't expect the glacier to be covered with rocks, but actually as a whole, glaciers are not just made of ice. They're made of ice and all of the rocks that are on top of and inside of that ice. Um, and they're not picturesque, white snow covered uh, landscapes, or at least not in the summertime. In the wintertime, they will be covered in snow, but for most of the summer, they're just bodies of ice that are covered in uh, thin and sometimes thick layers of rocks. These rocks um, accumulate into piles that are called moraines, which are um, pretty crucial to understanding some glacier anatomy. Uh, this diagram right here shows the really important moraines. Um, so terminal moraines, which are shown right here, are left behind when the glacier proceeds forward pushes up a bunch of rocks and then recedes back. So they just look like big mounds. Um, lateral moraines shown over here are the rocks that are pushed up to the sides of the valley as the glacier proceeds downwards. And then the medial moraine is the stripe in the middle. Um, that is formed when the tributary glaciers that are feeding into the main glacier scrape rocks off of the sides of the mountains that they're flowing past. And then when they come together, they form these black stripes running down the glacier. Um, this seems like a little bit of an oversimplification, but if you look at 
this aerial photo of the Montanusa Glacier, it's really not that much of an oversimplification. Um, this right here is the terminal moraine um, that is pushed up by the front of the glacier. This is where we set up our guide shack, where we got people um, equipped with all of their gear and stuff and where we started tours from. These are the medial moraines. Um, there's not just one, there's a couple of them and they're of varying sizes, but they really are just black stripes of rocks that are running along down the glacier. And underneath those is ice. In fact, underneath all of the moraines on the Mount Noose Glacier, there is ice. Um, moraines don't have to have ice underneath them in order to be considered moraines. They can just be piles of rock that are left behind. And uh, oftentimes they are, but since the Mount Noose Glacier is receding um, actively and has been in the areas where its moraines are very recently, there is currently still ice underneath them. Um, it's actively melting and in 50 years or so, uh, they'll probably just be piles of rocks, but currently they're piles of rocks and ice. And that same thing goes for these lateral moraines out here on either side of the valley. So that's kind of where the rocks are mostly located. They're not just located on moraines. There are piles of rocks basically everywhere on the glacier. It's covered in rocks, um, but mostly they're in these moraines. But that kind of leads to the question of where do these rocks come from? And the answer is that they come from the ground underneath the glacier. So if you go back to this diagram right here, you can kind of see that the glacier is digging down deeper into the ground than just would be the normal valley level right here. So you may have heard the saying before, um, this is just the tip of the iceberg, where the tip of the iceberg is above water and the rest of the iceberg is below water. Glaciers work in a somewhat similar fashion in which the tip of them is above ground and the rest of them is below ground. Um, they, dependent on their weight, burrow down into the ground and then move forward, acting as kind of like a big wedge or a shovel, overturning layers of rocks that are in their way. Um, the Montanusa Glacier is really, really, really big. So it's burrowing down basically to bedrock level um, for almost its entire length and churning up all of the layers of rock that are on top of that bedrock. Some of these rocks go up on top of the glacier and some are pushed in front of it, which are the rocks that form those moraines. But most of the rocks actually end up going underneath the glacier and are churned up by friction um, to become a type of unsorted sediment that we call glacial till. Um, I'm currently located in Amherst, Massachusetts, and uh, basically all of the ground underneath me for the first couple of feet is glacial till. So it's very, very, very common. But while all glaciers do produce glacial till, um, what type of rocks make up that till is totally dependent on the type of rocks that the glaciers are moving through and churning up. So um, here's a picture of some more rocks on top of the glacier. Um, for the Montanus Glacier, most of these rocks that are flowing through, almost all of it basically, are a type of mud-rich sandstone called gray wacky that forms in deep ocean environments. And although it very obviously is gray, there is not a whole lot that is actually wacky about this rock. Um, as you can see from this picture, it's basically what a random person off the street would think of if I shouted the word rock at them. However, if we zoom in on this rock in particular, um, we can see kind of one of the interesting things or the one interesting thing about gray wacky, which are these veins of quartz that are running through it. Um, I was telling my tours that these were caused by igneous intrusions of magma for about a month before I found out that that was completely untrue. I was corrected by the uh, previously pictured Lily. Um, so thanks to her. Uh, so gray wacky actually gets these veins of quartz in it as it moves along the ocean floor where it is exposed to thermal vents and undersea volcanoes, which superheat water that then fills the cracks in the gray wacky. Um, because it's sandstone, it's pretty weak. So it's gonna have some cracks in it. And so that superheated water flows into it and it leaves behind pure silica, which crystallizes into quartz. Um, none of that is actually important to understanding how the glacier works, but I am a geology student. I do like talking about rocks. Um, and it is important to note that the gray wacky was deposited in the late Cretaceous period, which is about 65 million years ago, at which point the valley that the Mount Nusa Glacier is currently residing in um, must have been an ocean floor. In paleontology class just this morning, I was looking at um, 
a map of T-Rex fossils. And uh, sure enough, there is an inland sea that kind of runs right through Alaska, right across where uh, the Montanus Glacier currently is. So it was an ocean, um, or at least an inland sea, 65 million years ago. And the glacier is only 2 million years old. And again, the ice that makes up the glacier is only 600 years old. So the rocks that are on top of the glacier are much, much older than the glacier itself. And the ice that actually makes up the glacier is much, much younger than the glacier itself, which is kind of this weird timeline um, to kind of get your head around. When we're looking at the environment super close to the glacier um, and looking at the glacial till that's being like actively produced maybe just a year, two years, three years ago, um, we actually get to see a part of that till that gets washed away um, first and that I don't really have uh, near me here in Massachusetts, and that is glacial silt. So um, here's a picture of me stuck in some glacial silt. Silt is just very, very fine grained sediment. So this stuff is gray because it's made out of that same gray wacky. Um, silt is just a grain of sediment. It's not a particular composition. Um, however, when this stuff gets wet, it does form something pretty cool, which is called thixotropic mud. Um, this is a mud that will let more and more water flow into it the more you agitate it. So it's it's a physics concept, not really a geology concept. If you've ever heard the term non-Newtonian fluid, this is what uh, people are talking about. If you apply really fast pressure, it's going to act like a solid, but slow pressure, it's going to act like a liquid. If you struggle, basically, it's going to pull you right down. So uh, we tell all the tour groups that this stuff acts like quicksand, which it very much does, as you can see from this picture of me right here. Uh, I got stuck in it multiple times, some of those times for fun. Um, but it is very, very sticky and very cool and pretty specific to um, a location that is close to a glacier like this one. Okay, so that's kind of a review of how glaciers work in particular. Talking about the Montanuska Glacier, um, the Montanuska is located about two hour drive northeast of Anchorage on the interior side of the Chugach Mountain Range, which you can see is this white area right below that red flag right there. It is a valley glacier, which means that it is flowing down from a tall mountain. Um, it is flowing down from a mountain called Mount Marcus Baker, which is located right about there. It is constrained within the valleys between the mountains that it is moving through, and it does not end in the ocean. So those are kind of the big qualifiers for it being a valley glacier. Um, it is 27 miles long, about four miles wide at its widest point. I hope all of the scientists in the audience will forgive me for my use of non-metric units, but I had to communicate this information to largely American tourists all summer. So those are the numbers that are stuck in my head. Um, and the Montanuska winds its way through the mountains um, before ending on a 10 mile straightaway between the Chugach and another mountain range to the north called the Talkeetnas, which is what uh, this picture right here is showing. So these mountains on the right, are the Chugach, this mountain right here, in particular is a mountain called Mount Wickersham. Um, behind it, although you can't see it in this picture, is where Mount Marcus Baker is. And then these mountains over here to the left are the beginning of those Talkeetna Mountains. So going back real quick to this picture, um, this kind of means that the Montanuska is actually positioned almost perfectly for a glacier because um, the mountains where it's gaining ice are close to the ocean. So they're picking up a lot of the snow and clouds that are coming off of the Pacific. Um, people in Alaska hate when you say this, but Alaska really is the Pacific Northwest. It gets a lot of rain, especially on the coast. So these mountains right here are catching that in the form of snowfall a lot of the time. And it means that the Montanuska is accumulating a lot of ice up there in the mountains. However, since it is on the north side of those mountains, it is actually in the rain shadow of them. So the Chugach Mountains right here stop all of that clouds, all of those clouds and weather from actually getting across to the glacier, they dump all of their rain and snow before they cross the mountains, which means that very little is actually rained on top of the glacier, which during the summer would significantly melt it. So it gets all of the precipitation to make it grow and none of the precipitation to make it melt, which is pretty important and a big factor as to why the Montanuska is as large as it is. Um, the Montanuska Glacier is actually the largest glacier in the United States that is accessible by car, which is a pretty big deal. Um, it has a lot, a lot, a lot of ice in it. So a lot 
of what I was trying to do on this job this summer was to spread awareness about climate change, which was often a bit difficult for um, two reasons. Uh, the first of which is general ignorance in the public for the most part. Um, and then also because uh, for conservative libertarian Alaskans who of glaciers, climate change is often kind of a sticky subject. And I'll get a little bit more into that later. So this may have been kind of a science job working on a glacier, but it was largely a customer service job, one where I was spending um, long amounts of time with dozens of strangers every day out on the ice, taking them for hikes, talking to them. Um, I was trying to get them to tip me. So, you know, that adds in a whole nother factor in the relationship. And so I really got to know kind of what the majority of people, or at least the majority of people who are vacationing in Alaska over the summer, um, know about glaciers and about climate change. And I learned that for the most part, it's, it's not a whole lot. So this presentation, I'll try to spread some truthful, if not exactly hopeful information about glaciers and anthropogenic human-caused climate change. Um, and forgive me for the obvious symbolism of a sunset over the glacier, but I am an English major in addition to a, to a geology major, so I really couldn't help myself. The first thing that I wanna talk about is that it isn't exactly anthropogenic climate change's fault that the Montanus Glacier is shrinking. It has been shrinking for the last 16,000 years or so approximately, which is the end of the last glacial maximum when glaciers across the globe started retreating backwards as the climate warmed up. This is important to note because it is what the majority of climate deniers will point to, uh, to deny anthropogenic climate change. And I got a whole lot of those people on tour. So yes, it is true that the glacier was shrinking long before humans were affecting the climate. However, Climate change is causing glaciers across Alaska to shrink faster. Most of them are shrinking at an incredibly alarming rate, and the Montanuska is one of those for sure. So here is a climate model map of Alaska with average temperatures in the 2000s, shown at the top right there, and then two different climate change projections. So the bottom one is a worst case scenario. Um, and the middle one is a not quite so bad, but still bad scenario. Um, so as you can see in both of these scenarios, the state is getting significantly warmer. That blue spot up at the top there is getting lighter and these the red stripe that is close to the ocean is getting brighter and brighter red. Um, and that little orange blob that is right here on this map is getting darker and darker. That's approximately where um, the Montanus Glacier is located. So this is a measurement of air temperature across the state with various climate projections. Um, but the story of how glaciers are affected by climate change is obviously a lot more complicated than uh, temperatures go up and glaciers get smaller. So I'm gonna to try to explain a little bit of the complications of that. Um, which mostly has to do with rising sea levels and rising ocean temperatures in addition to rising air temperatures. This picture right here is what is called a tidewater glacier. Um, this one specifically is a glacier called Northwestern Glacier. Um, and it is a tidewater glacier because it is calving into the ocean. So it is being actively affected by the tides, um, by ocean temperatures, by ocean levels, that sort of thing. You can see down at the bottom of the image here, all of these little pieces of ice that have broken off and are now floating around in the ocean. So these glaciers are massively affected by rising sea levels and ocean temperatures, which melt away significantly more ice than warming air temperatures do. Um, this is for a couple of reasons. The first is that rising sea levels start to undercut the glaciers as they're moving forward, um, which then causes those large chunks to fall off. So again, going back to those uh, dramatic calving videos that you've no doubt seen online, those typically don't happen on the Mountain Noose Glacier just because it's not getting undercut by these ocean currents. So large chunks aren't falling off. Um, over the entire summer, I actually only saw three calving events and they were all like kind of small chunks. So most of those enormous calving events are happening on glaciers like this one, and they're happening because of rising sea levels. The other piece of this is that 
rising ocean temperatures matter a whole lot more than rising air temperatures. Um, this gets into some physics stuff that I don't want to go super deep on, but having to do with the specific heat and heat capacity of air versus water and of liquid versus gas. So liquid water can carry a lot more energy than air can, which means that when that heats up the same amount that air does or even less, it's going to transmit a lot more of that heat into the ice when it comes in contact with it. So that water is going to be melting away at the glaciers like crazy, which can cause some enormous amounts of shrinkage and recession. This glacier right here is uh, Moyer Glacier in Glacier Bay National Park, uh, which has receded 60 miles since the start of the Industrial Revolution. So this picture on the left right here is from the early 1900s when um, the glacier was first being explored and named. And then the picture on the right is from the early 2000s taken in the exact same spot. And you can see how much it has gone back up the valley. So this is the kind of catastrophic levels of shrinkage that can happen to these tidewater glaciers. However, the Montanusa Glacier is not a tidewater glacier. So it is not being affected by the ocean. It is calving into its own tarn, not into the ocean, um, which means a couple of things. The first thing it means is that the Montanuska is actually shrinking or at least receding significantly more slowly than a lot of the other glaciers in Alaska. So it has only moved back about half a mile in the last 60 years, which is still bad, but compared to 60 miles in the last 120 years is pretty great. Um, but it is still facing some really serious problems that are causing it to lose mass and gain less ice. So the first of those is deflation. Um, so far, I've been talking about recession, which involves the glacier melting off of its front, so moving backwards. And that's kind of the typical dramatic one that we think about when we think of glaciers shrinking. Um, deflation is the process of melting off of the top of the glacier. Um, Important thing, again, even when the glacier is receding or moving backwards, it is still constantly flowing forward. So it is flowing downhill with gravity. It is just melting more than it is flowing forward. So it's moving backwards, even though it's flowing in the opposite direction that it is quote unquote moving. Um, but deflation is what happens when the glacier is melting off of its top. And this is actually where most glaciers lose most of their mass. So looking back at this aerial view in this picture right here, um, I'm going to bring up this pink line. This is where the glacier is melting due to recession. And this red area is where it is melting due to deflation. So this is kind of a gross oversimplification, but I hope you, this helps you visualize the scale to which deflation, even just melting off half of an inch off the top of the glacier, even if air is transmitting significantly less heat to the glacier than water would be over this broad of an area, this large of a surface area, melting off just a little bit is going to cause the glacier to lose a whole lot of mass. We don't know exactly how much mass that is for the Montanusa Glacier. Um, getting mass loss due to deflation is to significantly harder than getting recession data because um, it requires strategically placed GPS units and a lot of physics that have to do with like isostasy and stuff like that instead of just counting distance of how far the glacier has moved back. Um, but from research that has been done on other glaciers, we know that it is probably losing a whole lot of mass. But the Montanus Glacier is also in trouble for another reason, which is that it is accumulating significantly less ice this year than in years past, and that amount is decreasing every year. So there is a physical line on every glacier called the equilibrium line, which you can see on this diagram right here is labeled here. Um, when I say physical line, that means that it's not an imaginary line. You can actually see this line if you take a plane over the glacier. Um, I am very terrified of getting into small airplanes. So I've never done this, but I do know people who have, and you can actually see the equilibrium line running across the glacier, which makes it pretty easy to measure if it moves, which is really important. So this is the line between the zone of accumulation and the zone of ablation. The zone of accumulation is at the top of the glacier right here. This is where it is accumulating ice from snowfall. The zone of ablation is where it is melting off ice that is down here. For most glaciers, the majority of them are the zone of ablation. And this line actually changes throughout the seasons. Um, 
in the summer, it obviously moves up because more of the glacier is melting off and in the winter it moves down. So it's not like a fixed permanent thing. Um, however, at kind of peak melt season, we do measure it to see how it's changing every year. Um, in 2002, the equilibrium line for the Montanus Glacier was at 5,700 feet uh, elevation above sea level. In 2019, it had risen to 7,000 feet. So it's gone up 1,300 feet, rising up the glacier, which represents an exponential increase in the area of the glacier that is melting and an exponential decrease in the area that is accumulating. The reason for this rise in the equilibrium line is a combination of those rising average air temperatures that I've already talked about, as well as massive weather fluctuations. So one aspect of climate change that we've all become incredibly familiar with after the events of the past few years, from flooding in New York to wildfires in California to snowstorms in Texas, that sort of stuff is the severe weather patterns that climate change, specifically anthropogenic climate change, creates. So this graph right here represents snowfall the past 15 years projected onto the next 80. Um, so this is using some of the same climate uh, estimation data sets. Um, I actually made this graph myself using publicly available climate data sets um, just because I wasn't getting paid to do research doesn't mean that I wasn't going to do a little bit of it on my own time. I was trapped on a glacier for two months with 15 other geology nerds. So, you know, we pulled out our laptops from time to time. Here, each color of line represents 10 years and every dip that you see down at the bottom right here represents one summer. Um, so this is the point where snow accumulation goes down to zero because it is the summertime. And as you can see from this right side of the graph, um, weather patterns are actually causing increasingly tall snowfall spikes as the years go on, which means more snow is falling. That might be um, a little bit surprising to those of you who are still thinking about climate change in terms of global warming. However, you can also see that the variability between these spikes is becoming more and more extreme as weather patterns violently fluctuate between hot and cold. So this is a big problem for the glacier because for a glacier to accumulate ice, snow needs to sit for more than a year. In order to do that packing down process under its own weight, that takes time. You can't just do it in six months. You need more than a year in order to pack that snow down. So that means that that snow needs to stick around through the summertime. So even with these increasingly tall snowfall spikes, um, where more and more snow is falling, if that snow isn't sticking around through the summertime, it's not gonna be contributing anything to the growth or the health of the glacier. And so weather patterns caused by climate change with increasingly cold temperatures and increasing snowfall, um, you also get extremes on the other end, which is hotter and hotter and longer summers. So those summers are going to melt off the snowfall, even if that snowfall is increasing. And if temperatures continue to rise and weather patterns continue to vary more and more, the equilibrium line here is just going to keep getting higher and higher and higher up on the glacier until eventually it goes past the glacier and the glacier is no longer accumulating any ice whatsoever and it's just shrinking. So the results of these changes aren't immediately seen down at the face of the glacier where we give tours, but they represent an alarming shift in the health of the glacier over the last 20 years. Again, that increase in 1300 feet in the uh, equilibrium line is really, really bad. When I was out in the glacier in early July, which is peak melt season, um, the glacier was putting out 99 million gallons of water every hour. The entire state of Alaska in a day only uses 75 million gallons of water. So the Montanuska River, a fully fledged river that flows all the way to Anchorage is almost solely fed by the water output of this glacier. That's how much 99 million gallons per hour is. It is a ton of water. Going back to this graph right here, I just wanted to again bring up that idea of mass loss coming from this deflation. Even if air is bad at transmitting heat onto the ice over a surface area that is this large, just a tiny amount of melt is going to cause a ton of mass loss. And this is where that 99 million gallons every hour is coming from. This is uh, the main takeaway for the talk. So uh, feel free to 
you know, jot this down in your notes or take a screenshot or whatever you want to do. Climate change is bad for glaciers. It is slightly less bad for the Montanus Glacier, but still very, very, very bad. Okay. This is where um, the presentation kind of pivots a little bit um, to get back to that politics point that I was talking about earlier. So tourists and glaciers as a result are a huge source of income for Alaska and the Montanuska Glacier makes more money than many others. Um, why is that? Well, it is because this glacier is privately owned. You might be thinking a privately owned glacier Yes, that is accurate. How does that happen? Well, it's a really long and complicated story that I still don't exactly understand, um, but I'm gonna try my best to explain it to the best of my knowledge, um, which means that this lecture is going to rapidly switch from being a science lecture to being a history lecture. In 1971, Congress passed the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act or ANCSA, which established 13 Alaska Native Regional Corporations and gave them rights to large amounts of land and finances. They are all shown on this map right here. They are what Alaska has instead of reservations. And um, in a lot of circumstances, they seem to possibly be more effective than reservations just because of the immense amount of power that corporations hold in the United States. Um, so in seven, 1971, indigenous Alaskans were given tons of rights to all this land all at once, but with so much land and not a lot of people to run it, the most efficient way oftentimes to make money off of it was to lease it out to other people and companies who flocked to the state to take advantage of the situation. This is exactly what happened with the Montanus Glacier. The Siri Corporation, which stands for Cook Inlet Region Incorporated, and is shown right here, is one of 13 native corporations and was given the rights to the first seven miles of the Montanus Glacier and some of the surrounding land, including the only access point to get onto the glacier. They set out to lease this land and a bidding war started between the two companies that were already giving tours on the glacier. Somehow, and I still don't understand how this happened, a random businessman named Bill Stevenson, who is pictured on the right in this incredibly grainy photo, meeting with a Siri representative on the left, won the bidding war and essentially became judge, jury, and executioner as to who was allowed onto the glacier as well as when. 40 years later, and he still owns the place as well as the company that I worked for. Bill became pretty controversial in Alaska over the last year when he stopped offering a tour option where people could pay just the gate fee to get onto the glacier and go out on their own. Starting this year, all people going out onto the glacier would have to go with a guide. Not all of these guides were through our company. In fact, lots of companies gave tours on the glacier, but for local Alaskans who enjoy their wilderness and their freedom, this decision was pretty unpopular. This picture right here is uh, some friends of friends that I went on a glacier backpacking trip with who worked for the USGS and really, really disapproved of the management of the Montanusa Glacier. Um, they called Bill the troll under the bridge of the Mott, which I think is very funny, but also gets into a really important point, which is that lots of different people from all sorts of different demographics disapprove of the private ownership of the glacier. So locals who have lived in uh, Glacier View, the town right outside of the Montanus Glacier, disapprove of it. Um, you have lived in Alaska for generations, as well as just environmentalists and outdoor adventurers, and also a whole lot of tourists. Bill will tell you that the decision to restrict glacier access was made for safety reasons, because too many people are getting hurt on the glacier. Um, but most locals will tell you that it is for money reasons. And Bill is a man with a well-earned reputation of being a cutthroat business person. So I think it's pretty hard to give him the benefit of the doubt on this one. And as someone who personally knew him, it's hard to claim that he cares about the safety of the clients more than the money that he's making from them. Of course, there's also the uh, complicated politics involved with the Siri Corporation owning the glacier. Some portion of the money from every ticket sale, although I don't know how much, went to paying for the lease and thus went straight to Siri, which then used it for education and healthcare for all of their members, which is a great place for the money to go to. But at the same time, Bill is just one random white dude who's making immense profits off of the whole situation and has certainly been given more power than he deserves. Personally, as the one tasked with keeping the tourists out of cracks and holes in the ice, like these ones right here, or these ones right here. Um, I'm, 
honestly terrified of the thought of them being turned loose on the glacier without anyone to keep track of them. But at the same time, giving one man authority over an entire 27 mile long glacier is kind of insane. And um, I'm not a huge fan of turning an amazing landmark like this one into a cash cow. So I'm still conflicted over the whole thing. Um, over the summer, I justified it to myself with the thought that if I could convince even just a few people about the reality and importance of climate change, then my presence on the glacier was worth it, which made this uh, the only online review I ever got mean a whole lot to me, but I'm still not entirely convinced. So I hope that some of you have learned something from my talk today, because that would make it all the more worth it. And of course, if anyone has any questions for me, oh, I think. Okay. Uh, first <laughs> yes. of all, let me, let me thank you so much. Um, Nathan has said that that he's interested in possibly pursuing a career in science edu or science communication. And I can definitely say, I think we all can say he is well on his way to um, that career if, if he chooses. That was just an incredible talk. Not to mention the photographs were amazing. So um, let me see if, uh, I guess if people have questions, um, we can try to, why don't you just start talking? And if we start interrupting each other, then we can put them on the chat. So who's got a question? Hi, Nathan, great job. Strong D'Angelo. Uh, you said that you watched a relatively small chunk of ice fall off. Um, since the glacier is so big, um, I'm wondering what you mean by relatively small. Do you mean the size of a refrigerator, the size of a person, the size of a car? Like, how? what type of relative size are you talking about? Um, about the size of a refrigerator. Um, so we call them ice boulders. Um, I, I did watch a chunk of ice about the size of a building um, collapse on the glacier, but it was not on the face and not falling into the water. So it wasn't considered a calving event. It was just a place where a stream had undercut it and then it, like the shelf collapsed. Um, but yeah, so relatively small being about the size of a refrigerator. Cool, thanks. Um, I'm gonna ask one, I'll jump in here. Um, and then there's one in the chat. So um, my question is you, when you had the, the slide early on with the, you're talking about the gray wackies, um, yeah. Was that a end in, in an end glacial or super glacial stream there? So was that depositing an esker? Um, uh, let me see here. I think the answer is yes. I took uh, I didn't take very many pictures of the rocks. So when I was trying to find a picture of just gray wacky, I all of them had more interesting things. Yeah. So yeah. this is yes, it is depositing an esker. Um, it's a stream that's carving a tunnel into the glacier, which is why I took a picture of this in the first place. Um, and then you can see that some of it is already collapsing and depositing these rocks and stuff right here. Yeah, that's a great picture. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen lots of eskers that were left behind by glaciers, but seeing yeah. one actually forming is, is pretty amazing. Okay, so we have one from uh, Barry Jacobson, I'm guessing a relative maybe. Uh, how do the rocks plowed up at the front get on top of the whole sheet? Um, so most of those rocks have been there for since the glacier, um, plowed in through those rocks at the beginning. Um, and there's a lot more rocks at the front of the glacier than on the back. So, um, when I was on my backpacking and trip and went really far back at that point, there's a lot less rocks. Um, the front of the glacier is actually oscillating. It moves forward in the winter and then back during the summer. And so we get that recession from just an overall average of moving backwards. So every, uh, every winter it's churning up more rocks and then kind of melting backwards. So a lot of the rocks like in this picture get up on top just from that oscillation, digging up more and more of them. The rocks their back have either fallen off of mountains and landed on top of it or have been there since you know, however many years ago when it was initially coming through the area and digging them up. 
Yeah, so you, so you get some scraped off the sides too that form some of those um, medial moraines and stuff. Okay, another one from, from Barry. Uh, what life forms live in that accumulation of rocky material on top of the glacier? Microbes, lichen, plants? Um, there, is, there are some microbes that live on top of the glacier, not a whole lot, um, no plants. We get glacier moss, which is very resistant to cold um, and will grow on the glacier. On most glaciers, it's really, really rare. Um, on the Montanus Glacier, for whatever reason, it's actually pretty common. We don't know why some of us tour guides came up with theories about iron deposits from the surrounding mountains and things like that, but no actual scientific research has been done on it. So we, uh, we don't really know. Okay, here's an important question from Cecilia. How did you get out of the mud? <laughs> um, so I got out of the mud by just like wiggling my leg back and forth just really slowly for a really long period of time, which kind of liquefied the mud around it enough for me to um, pull it out. And I also had help from a couple of other guides who grabbed onto my hands and dragged me. Um, I have also gotten stuck in mud of that kind, ironically, um, in the Amherst area where there are some really uh, neat glacial deposits. Um, so I know that is, you usually need help getting out of it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So Gary Ostrauer, um, glacial melt in Asia is apparently negatively affecting the Mekong River and irrigation generally in Indochina. Is there any parallel to the effect of glacial melt in Alaska regarding North American agriculture or is Alaska just too remote? Um, it's kind of the opposite actually. So there's some interesting stuff about this glacial silt because so much of it is being produced basically all of the environments downstream of the glacier are being affected by it and the silt is actually largely waterproof or water resistant so the water will flow into it when it's agitated but when it's just sitting still it um it's pretty water resistant so when it rained on the glacier there would just be like half an inch of water that's just sitting on top because it doesn't get absorbed um so that's why it's messing up environments um, but the uh, Matsu Valley, which is um, downstream from the Matanusa Glacier, is actually basically the only place in all of Alaska that has agriculture. Um, and it is because the silt is so mineral rich that things can actually grow there, even though the growing season is so short because the summers are so short. Obviously, the glacier has retreated from there like a long time ago. And so that silt has been given some time to weather and break down and plants have been able to put roots mm -hmm. down and stuff in it. Um, but it's actually helping agriculture or its past existence in the region has helped agriculture for Alaska. All right, there's one here from Bob Myers. Nathan, can you say anything about cryokonites on the glacial surface? Yes, I can. Um, so, Cryoconite holes are produced by um, uh, wind-blown material that gets on top of the glacier, which is dark. And so then when sun is hitting the glacier, it is reflecting off of the white ice, but being absorbed by like these little patches of dust or ash or whatever. Um, and then they start boring down into these like little circular holes. So um, we see those a ton on the glacier um, up, uh, especially in areas that are prone to getting hit by both wind and sun. Um, and in like further back on the glacier, they can get to be about as like big as your head. Um, and one of my cool fun facts about the Mountainous Glacier is that during the Cold War, the US government was actually um, testing cryoconite holes uh, on the Mountainous Glacier and glaciers across Alaska for radioactive material that would indicate um, nuclear testing of weapons by the Soviets, which then the particles get carried by the jet stream across the Pacific and then land on glaciers in Alaska. Yes, thank you. Well done, <laughs> excellent. Okay. And, and in, in Green, let me, let me just Go follow ahead. up. In, in Greenland, uh, this is a big deal on the glaciers that I saw in Greenland and probably world's glaciers. And so you've got dust collecting on the tops of Greenland glaciers from the Gobi Desert and different places. All That's really cool. But, but my favorite creature, the tardigrade, is also oh, yeah. found in some of these, yep. some of these holes. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Nice. 
Okay, so um, I don't see any more questions and um, it's 10 after. I'm guessing maybe Nathan might have to go to a class <laughs> and some of the rest of us do too. Um, yes. So I wanna thank him again. It was just an amazing talk and also uh, let people know that the, we are recording our talks and they up uh, they are up on our um, YouTube channel. So you can either search for that or, or email me for a link. And um, uh, if you want to see it again, or you want to share it with somebody, um, and uh, again, I'm just that was just an amazing talk. And the photographs, my gosh, they were just awesome. So I'm going to have to email you and get some of those photographs from my. <laughs> yes, of course. All right, thank you very much. Applause thank you all so much. This is awesome. We'll see you all in two weeks. <laughs>